Keith Mayo is going to do proximal femoral osteotomies and non-traumatic deformity. Okay, so we've had a lot of uh, treatment of preoperative planning, and what I want to do in this brief section is essentially just go over the applications of osteotomy and proximal femur for hip reconstruction. And we'll go through just cases. I'm not going to go through the planning. Each of these will have a, a custom solution. So we'll do a valgus or abduction, varus or adduction with or without rotation. Mike Marin is going to treat that topic later. We'll do a true or absolute neck lengthening and then a limb short. Uh, cases. This is a 14 year old that um, about 18 months prior to this had dislocated his hip skiing and now has a very large uh, necrotic segment of his epiphysis uh, in this view. But his real problem is that he doesn't have that much pain, but he feels like his left leg is long because he has a mechanically fixed adduction contracture. It's not, you know, so it's soft tissue, but primarily a bony problem. And so if we take our same techniques that we've used before, we can do an abduction osteotomy that will reposition his leg to give him effectively a level pelvis. And this is what it looked like when he was now, I think, 21. And, and I had really wanted to come back at a later date and do a lateral trochanteric transfer but he was having none of that. You can see that he already has a lot of modeling around the uh, proximal femur and he didn't want to even have the plate taken out. And here he is at uh, age 29 uh, with still a reasonable joint space and reasonable function. He's now 33 and the end is coming as far as his uh, need ultimately for hip replacement. So same basic techniques a higher CCD angle than normal, but a different overall objective. A lot of patients with hip conditions have had previous childhood surgery. This is a dysplastic hip that had been treated with a varus uh, derotation uh, osteotomy as a child. Uh, this is what it, the position views look like. It was probably a subtrochanteric level osteotomy. Um, but we went back and through a transitional uh, intertroch, subtroch osteotomy to closing wedge and using a 95 degree plate and get back to a relatively normal position. And then the appearance of five years um, after intervention. Um, we can do Varus as well. This is a, a 18 year old girl who had a previous uh, malposition periostabular osteotomy. She couldn't flex her hip. They thought her problem was a non union, so they went back and plated her pubis. Um, but a real problem is the position of the hip. But more importantly, she has a valgus and averted neck. And as part of a solution in a younger person, you have to address those issues. And so this is her aggregate total anatorsion of around over 40 degrees um, with a commensurate asymmetry in medial versus lateral rotation. And so our plan was essentially to use, unfortunately I had to use a pediatric plate for this since her neck wasn't big enough for this. So I planned for approximately a 10 degree adduction or varizing osteotomy. Uh, and this is what it looked like initially. This is the longest blade that we had available, unfortunately. And we'll see where that comes in to be a problem later. So this would be the opening wedge purely. So we have a point of medial contact in a pure opening lateral wedge. And then we put an inner position graft in. And as we set that up at the end for doing a tensioning using the, the articulated tensioning device, What's happened is that I've actually crushed the metaphysis through this allograft wedge and I've lost part of my correction with the tensioning. Uh, and so she probably had an eating disorder and so her 
bone was uh, not robust, shall we say. And so this is what she ended up looking like initially. And then finally, at healing. So her CCD angle is down. And one of the problems with doing um, a verizing osteotomy is that there is an obligatory modest leg length discrepancy. I had projected for five millimeters um, on this standing film, it appears to be a bit more than that, although um, actually clinically it looks level. So that's a varus, in this case, varus derotation osteotomy uh, for um, the classic um, association between dysplasia and the valgus antiverted neck. A better example, this is a 14-year-old um, girl with cerebral palsy who wants to dislocate. Um, she's nearly 100 kilos and um, her mom can't take care of her, so we're trying to save the sip. And this is clearly going to require both sides of the joint. And this required a fairly significant verizing, in this case, uh, retroverting as, uh, femoral osteotomy in addition to the acetabular component. And she's now almost 16 years out as well. So um, you can do a lot. In this case, we're willing to accept some uh, shortening just to keep this uh, now 28-year-old um, um, female being able to walk and do transfers. You can um, lengthen the femoral neck on an absolute sense. Wait, I'm not going to do uh, relative neck lengthening, but you can do a trochanteric osteotomy. You can then follow that with a surgical dislocation of the hip. You're going to do an oblique osteotomy of varying obliquities, which will allow you to essentially laterally translate the shaft and give you a medial neck. And this is an example of what one of those look like combined with a periostabular osteotomy. Uh, we've got about 25% uh, shaft offset in this setting. Um, and that's probably as much as I'd be willing to do. This was a 20-year-old and when we started. And then a more extreme example is this, which is a, a more severe cox of breva associated with Perthes disease. And so we've been through the uh, trochanteric osteotomy, the dislocation ultimately, and then the seating chisel insertion, and then a long oblique osteotomy, and then in the situation we're gaining a leg length as well as an offset, which effectively gives him a much longer uh, femoral neck. You can also do shortenings. This is a 17-year-old girl whose problem is not her birthday sip on the right side, but pain on the left side because she has a long leg measured in multiple ways at three centimeters. And what happens here is there are a variety of different ways to shorten the limb. I'm going to show you only one. So she had a three centimeter leg length discrepancy. So this gave her an effective uh, or accentuated her mild left hip dysplasia when she was standing on both legs. And so uh, this is her non-standing view as far as the comparison in a lateral view measuring to make sure we can get a standard blade in. We're going to go through this uh, sequence again. So reference Kirshner wires. We're going to do an incomplete intertrochanteric osteotomy, a complete subtrochanteric osteotomy. We're going to do a bony resection. And then we're going to shorten this, essentially translate the diaphysis up, having measured the relative widths of the diaphysis relative to the metaphysis to make sure it's going to work. And so this is the execution with a seating chisel in place and then shortening. And then after tensioning and one screw and then final position with a well-aligned canal for any subsequent procedures. So as a very brief summary of, um, of sort of an aggregate of all the things that people have done over the years for various non-traumatic the form is the proximal femur. The great thing about these techniques is that they're readily transferable from a trauma skill set that you've already seen now on two uh, separate Saturdays for addressing mal and non-unions of the proximal femur. 
So I'm hopeful that somewhere out there in the audience, there's going to be uh, an interest for expanding your trauma skill set into a broader hip preservation set. That I'm going to 